So the structure of this presentation will be my time at the British Library, working on site and from home, a short video, followed by a few words of thanks and then time for questions. When I began my internship at the British Library, I was so excited to learn from many incredibly talented conservators in the department in which I was to become a small part of. The BLCC has such a huge breadth of knowledge. With you all training at various times and in different places, it has resulted in a vast range of experience. But to those of you that I didn't get to spend as much time with, thanks to COVID, I thought I would start by saying a little bit about me. At the age of four, I decided I wanted to be a conservator. With my parents, I visited Brighton Pavilion and saw a woman conserving wallpaper. She patiently explained to me what she was doing and I sat and watched her. Since then, I've always wanted to work in heritage, but it wasn't until my teenage years that I found out about book and paper conservation. After completing my bachelor's, I worked front of house in various London museums. I spent two years working at the British Museum whilst volunteering on preventive cleans of historic houses and libraries. I also volunteered one day a week at the Maritime Museum in the paper conservation studio, led by the senior conservator and made bespoke housing for the collection with objects ranging from flat work to celestial globes. In June 2019, I graduated from Canwell College of Arts with an MA in book and paper conservation, specialising in books and archives. Throughout my time at Camberwell, I had several placements and conservation projects from various institutions, including the v &A, UCL Special Collections, the London Library and the Bodleian. Whilst on these placements, I was made aware of my desire to work as a conservator within a working library with an exhibition and loans programme. I began my internship in book conservation at the British Library in November 2019. Originally designed to be a year, this was then extended to 15 months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. From November until lockdown began, I received such wonderful training at my bench and my internship was everything I thought it would be and more. As my internship started to take shape, I had an expectation of how I would spend my time over the next 12 months. However, this changed. We could not have foreseen the events that would happen in 2020, and we went into lockdown four months into my internship. As my internship is through ICON, the standards I adhere to are the same as accreditation. My official internship documentation takes the form of quarterly reports completed by myself and Zoe, and quarterly reviews with my ICON mentor, Lorna. To support this, I also completed an activity monitor. This is a list of everything I've done throughout my internship broken down into six parts, ICON's five key standards and professional judgment and ethics. I provide evidence for each standard and then I rate myself on a novice to expert scale on a quarterly basis, seeing how I've hopefully improved as my internship has progressed. Zoe and I decided at the beginning that I should rate myself against my own improvements and experiences. As conservators, we are constantly learning and evolving our practice. So it takes time, if ever, to feel like an expert in anything. I initially found this process very daunting. It is a detailed document of ethical standards and in-depth topics. So I had to think, how could I make this document as useful as possible for myself and for my experience? I began by breaking the standards down into key statements so that I fully understood what they were asking for giving me a clear objective of how to be a multifaceted conservator. I also reformatted the activity monitor online so it could be a shared document between myself, my supervisor Zoe, and my mentor Amy with their comments along the way. At the end of my internship, my activity monitor is now around 80 pages. Many thanks again to Zoe and Amy for reading through this at each deadline. One aspect I found the most useful was to quantify this data from each standard to see how my time was split. Being a more visual learner, this took the very glamorous form of a pie chart for each quarter. Each colour represents a standard such as assessment of cultural heritage or preventive measures. From this, I could clearly see how my time was split each quarter. I could see the areas which were strong and which were lacking. Perhaps lacking is the wrong word, but it showed that some areas were more impacted than others, highlighting areas of conservation that the BL do really well such as conservation options and strategies and organisation and management, which were always prevalent. I think this highlights how useful it has been for my internship to be supported by ICON. I think having that link early on in my career to a professional body has been so valuable. 
It has definitely changed the way I approach my practice. By using the core values and guidelines I can have for accreditation and training myself early into that way of thinking, see how, how the work I do as a conservator fits into certain categories. I do plan to continue to complete an activity monitor in a more informal way after the end of my internship, continuing to use these categories, seeing the strengths from each role or project I undertake and how it informs my way of thinking. I believe this will be very useful when I reach the stage of accreditation, which hopefully won't feel as daunting because I will have subconsciously been structuring my practice this way all along. Right, that's enough about graphs, on to some practical projects. In January, the conservation teams embark on a selection of conservation bids to treat throughout the year. Curators select items from their department in need of conservation treatment. This treatment can take any form and its time frame will be anything from over 10 hours to several hundred. I shadowed different members of my team when they visited items situated in various collections. From large scale maps to delicate Chinese export paintings on pea leaves, the projects were very varied. After viewing the item, initial research was carried out and treat treatment proposals drawn up. I was encouraged to put forward my own. Prior to starting my internship, estimating time and materials was something I really wanted to refine. And this was the perfect platform for this. This was also an opportunity to, collab to collaborate, not just with conservators in my team, but with textile conservators, Liz Rose and Emma. At the British Library, I worked on a wide range of conservation treatments and been involved in various conservation projects. This includes parchment manuscripts, several brown Civil War tracts, 20th century paper bindings, several early Western manuscripts, large scale bindings, rolled format items, various digitization projects, and many flat items in need of treatment and framing for exhibition. Led by Amy, I've constructed a large British Library guard book, the biggest book I've ever bound, shown here. I've also learned many new workshop skills, such as leather and thread dyeing, and had my first attempt at gold tooling. For this presentation, I've narrowed it down to four main practical projects. A 12th century parchment manuscript. This full leather type back binding with parchment text block was in an unstable condition, with the sewing broken and the spine split completely in two. The boards were held on by white textile joints, obscuring the marbled end papers. The end bands were split at the tail and mostly missing at the head. Guided by Amy and Zoe, I devised a treatment plan. This project was a combination of previous and new skills. To compensate for the stress caused by the tight back structure, I created a Japanese tissue cast of the spine to create a new hollow. This papier-mâché approach was something I'd read about but not put into practice. The use of celloderm dyes to tone leather was also something I had not encountered but was very affected. effective. I created the inner joints with deacidified and lined marbled paper, a technique taught to me by Zoe which was less visually obtrusive than using a continuous tone as I had planned and done previously. I was very pleased with the outcome of this project. Now with a new hollow, end bands and leather spine, the book is functional and can be requested by readers once more. This image was featured in the British Library's official Twitter, showing the before and after photograph of the end band and tail of the binding. It was thrilling to see so many people share and comment on the image, spreading conservation awareness. This post is one of the most interactive tweets of the year. For this project, I was supported and led by Heather Marshall. The manuscript was in poor condition, boards detached and too short for the text block, which is protruding and vulnerable. The sewing deteriorated, but seven, several fragments remain, including evidence of end bands. There were losses to the spine leather and the outer folios of each section. This binding is in need of extensive treatment and was sadly something I didn't get to finish due to lockdown. However, I still learned an awful lot through the work I did complete on the manuscript. As this document was largely around about organization, research into Islamic bindings and their structure, documentation and succinct collation. Prior to treatment, I researched the Islamic Codex and its context within Eastern and Western collections. With Heather's guidance, we completed the assessment form developed at St. Catherine's Monastery by Nicholas Pickwood. This is a form I observed at university. Heather was part of the original survey at St. Catherine's and therefore a perfect guide throughout the process. At the beginning of documentation, I had so many unanswered questions about the book structure. By the end, I felt through extensive analysis directed by Heather and some detective work, I knew the structure and mechanics of this book well. 
I then created a collation map documenting throughout with photography and detailed drawings, providing evidence for the structure as I disbound the volume. I then carried out repairs to the textbook and the next step was to re-sew and begin board extension. For this project, I was able to create a model of the manuscript shown here on the slide to fully understand the mechanics of this binding. I also practice Islamic end bands at home during lockdown to keep my hands busy. In the autumn of 2020, I began work on two 9th century Chinese scrolls. This project was led by Liz Randall Narotsky. My experience with roll material was limited, so it was wonderful to learn from Liz and I have an understanding of their and have an understanding of their materiality. After documentation and surface cleaning, we tested the inks. As the inks were stable, we progressed to humidification and removal of previous repairs and mountain technique, which was now causing tension to the original material. One of the scrolls I was working on had the addition of a very fine gauze adhered to the recto. I removed this slowly, section by section, with light humidification. Before the January lockdown, I was roughly 75% of the way through this process. The main skills I learned from this project was the familiarity with rolled material, how to allocate treatment hours realistically. For example, the removal of the gauze was a slow process and Liz had budgeted accordingly. I also really admired the way that Liz organized the solubility testing. It was a brilliantly laid, way out, laid, laid out way of doing it and it's a method I will continue to use. In September, we had the arrival of a musical manuscript, teaching pieces written in the hand of Johann Sebastian Bach and his second wife, Anna. As we unpacked the manuscript with the curator, Chris, we listened to the pieces. We played them through my phone, which is probably not quite what Bach had intended. But as we listened to the music, the notes on the page started dancing before us. It was a wonderful, a wonder, uh, a wonderful humbling moment to handle the scores that had inspired so many. I thought about how many musicians, musicians had learned from this piece and felt very, very lucky. The media is iron gall ink, which has severely degraded in places. I have disbound the volume and completed extensive solubility testing of the inks. The next step is to remove the folios from their acidic mounts and treat them aqueously using a calcium phytate treatment. This project was being led by me, supported by Zoe, who is an expert in treating iron gall ink. They will then be repaired and remounted using a more sympathetic and accessible method before being stored together in a custom made phase box. Unfortunately, this treatment was then halted due to the January lockdown, but hopefully can continue once the studios can be accessed again. As we all know, conservation is a well connected community, but most of what we do is behind the scenes. As an emerging professional, I love sharing what we do and conservation is always something I'm happy to explain to those outside the profession. I would describe conservation as the management of change, safeguarding collections, preserving items for future generations to receive knowledge and enjoyment from. As a conservator, we are responsible for the care of cultural heritage from the object in, or collection in question to the environment in which it resides. Book conservators have an understanding of the mechanics of a book and its structure, be it culturally, visually, economically, etc. They have a growing knowledge of the different binding processes in order to conserve and care for those that are damaged and an awareness of deterioration and how collections are altered by age. I have learned many new skills while at the BL and I have felt my knowledge of a conservator's role broaden. It I was also given opportunities to share my own skills and growing experience through open days outside the studio. My table de demonstrating book structures is shown here. Alongside these, I took the initiative to create my own illustrated handouts, one showing a labelled drawing of a typical Western binding. I described this as what a conservator sees when they look at the book and its structure. The other showing some tools used by binders and conservators in the creation of a book, from sewing frame to end band silks. I also took part in several tours discussing my current projects on my bench. This was a great opportunity to discuss objects mid-treatment and show my decision-making process. I increased my online content by creating a specific Instagram account at the start of my placement after discussing the copyright policies of both the BL and ICON. I wrote a post for the Collection Care blog detailing my time as a book conservation intern in lockdown, and I participated in the Ask a Conservator Day on the 18th of November. Held in remembrance of the Florence floods, conservators around the world invited others to ask questions through social media platforms. 
A team of six of us came together to answer questions posed to us via the BL Collection Care Twitter, Twitter account. It was wonderful to brainstorm together and select the appropriate answers and phrasing. Despite it being fast paced, it was very enjoyable and it was well received, with our first tweet being interacted with over 27,000 times on the day. On the 17th of March, we went into our first lockdown and we all started to experience our world digitally. Our weekly team and departmental meetings followed suit and we all added Zoom to our daily vocabulary. I was involved in many working from home projects, far too much to talk about in one presentation. I've listed some here, but I'm gonna talk about these five briefly. I was part of the literature review subgroups for the papyrus and bordery attachment treatment reviews. In addition to this for bordery attachment, I collated our literature review findings to create a two page summary. And for papyri, I investigated previous conservation methods. I also created a timeline for each project with an overview of how conservation processes have evolved. The papyrus timeline is shown here. It was a wonderful collaborative experience seeing all our thoughts come together and a privilege to be part of it. I was particularly in awe of Francesca and Liz who led the project so brilliantly. Like most of us, I also spent a lot of my time at home researching and article writing. I also connected with other ICON interns virtually and attended the ICON Pathway Week in July. Through webinars to training courses, I began to build gaps in my knowledge. I also considered CPD in a more formal setting by filling out the CPD section of the accreditation form and then comparing it to Amy's as she has begun the accreditation process. It was wonderful to have an opportunity to see how it's filled out for when I consider applying in the future. Thanks to Mark, Graham, Morgan and Jackie, I also had an insight into external conservation and conservation workflows at the BL. Before joining these, I was unaware of the large amount of conservation projects which are outsourced to external companies and contracts. They have been refining their risk assessments and devising workflows outlining the various conservation processes that this team manages. It's been incredibly interesting understanding the logistics of each of these programs and the steps taken to achieve them. With Liz Rose, Rebecca and fellow intern Emma, I worked on a scientific project from home, collaborating with a textile conservation student at Glasgow University. Through this remote project, we analysed the effects of blotter washing on painted paper and textile samples. On these, we emulated flaking and fugitive pigments made by mixing baby powder and egg white, a brilliant idea of Liz's. These samples are replicas of an actual object, a Burmese textile map currently in the BR's collection, which is in need of washing, but has concerns regarding its friable media. I made a primitive humidity chamber and set it up in my bathroom. I owe a lot of thanks to my patient housemates who had to ask me to move my science whenever they wanted to have a shower. One of my last working from home projects was the BLCC Oral History Project. When we were on site in November, a few members of conservation had a socially distanced tea break together. One of those members was Francis, an incredibly accomplished conservator and wonderful person. Due to retire in September after being at the library for over 40 years, we talked about her experiences and the many changes she has seen over the years working for the British Library. We discussed ideas of gender in conservation, as it is now considered to be quite a female dominated industry. Comparing my experience as a female joining the profession to Francis's experience over 40 years ago. After this discussion, we considered the importance of recording conversations like this from Francis and other experienced colleagues of the BLCC who have seen the BL evolve from its beginnings in the bindery. During January lockdown, this project began to take shape. Zoe, Amy and I created a pro proposal and spoke to the oral history team within the library. They gave us a huge amount of information. And after encouragement from Mark, we began outlining how could this could be possible. I coordinated our proposal, compiling research, resources, aims, costs, equipment needed, structure and possible outcomes. I'm very excited to see where this project will go. My first introduction to preventive conservation at the BL was through mould awareness training led by the wonderful Karen. I was able to put this into practice with monthly shifts in the quarantine room, doing remedial mould cleaning on new acquisitions or items flagged for mould treatment. Prior to lockdown, I worked on the recently acquired Tony Benn and Heathcote Williams archives. This gave me a, an understanding of how to clean very fragile material, material safely, and also in, informed me that Gordon Brown has very messy handwriting. 
After further discussion with Karen and the preventive team, I understood what is most relevant to the British Library in terms of preventive conservation. I was shown their data loggers, their unique salvage programme with the brilliant use of salvage phones and the use of the Synergy system. I also visited the King's Library Tower to see how the environment is controlled for open books on display. This led to further discussion of the environmental monitoring programme. Karen then invited me to be involved in the department's annual calibration of data loggers. This involved collecting all the data loggers which monitor the environment of the whole library. It was an enjoyable day, running around the entire building, collecting the loggers directly from locations, gave me a real insight into the vast range the preventive team covers. From offices to reading rooms, curators' desks to exhibition spaces, showing just how broad their remit is. I could understand in depth how and why we monitor and the problems they face, even in a purpose-built institution. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to ascend the six floors of the King's Tower, including the monitoring system on the roof. I was then invited by Nicole to join her and Scott and Lee in planning the salvage exercise for the Unfinished Business Exhibition. It was wonderful to see how creative they all were in their approach, making the exercise interesting and memorable, whilst also including all of the key information. It also made me aware of the steps disaster planning takes in an exhibition set setting, pertaining to the retrieval and salvage of acquisitions on display, informing the salvage team of where the high profile and vulnerable items are and what the correct protocol is if we are to encounter a disaster such as a fire or flood. Sadly, I couldn't attend the physical salvage training, but I did get to complete several online sessions during lockdown, showing how versatile the printed team are. Lastly, in February 2021, two training sessions were organised by the preventive team, one on environmental monitoring, the other on integrated pest management. I was placed on the IPM team and got to work researching typical pests and the damage they cause. My main task was to come up with the practical part of the training, which would follow Karen's in-depth overview. The practical presentation focused on the main press pests prevalent in the UK, which pose a risk to our collections such as pest beetles, moths, and damp indicators. Conceived by myself and two other colleagues, Scott and Nicole, we thought of creative ways to share this content and mot motivate others to get involved. After initial planning, Scott and I decided to deliver this information to the attendees in a stereotypical game show style, appropriately named Match That Pest. We had a lot of fun making it and writing awful puns for which we received praise, sniggers, and the odd boo from the group, who all seemed engaged, Thank you to all who attended for humouring us. In order to feel comfortable answering questions on the topic, I learned an awful lot through researching IPM and talking to experienced members of the team. And I have felt my preventive conservation knowledge expand. I also attended the environmental training led by Karen, which was incredibly informative and is something I hope to pursue when working at other institutions in the future to complement my role as a bench conservator. Prior to lockdown, I shadowed Liz during the Dean's store with a Buddhism exhibition, as she condition checked and signed out several large and heavy objects with the conservator from the Horniman Museum. I also assisted Rebecca in the Hebrew exhibition install. We installed a large and very heavy Torah into the glass case, shown here. Over lockdown, I shadowed Alexa in the monthly project meetings of Unfinished Business. It was wonderful to see an exhibition take shape. Despite the delayed opening, we had updates on how the physical build was going, whilst also building an online presence to reach those at home. It was also incredibly useful to see how Alexa worked within her role, presenting conservation's loan updates to the rest of exhibitions and loans department. I also saw the predictions of how exhibitions and loans would look in a post-pandemic world, and observed the changes the exhibition would need to take in the wake of lockdown such as an incre increased distance between displays to account for social distancing and seeking alternatives to the use of touchscreens and headphones. Shadowing these project board meetings continued until the exhibition opened in October. It was wonderful to then visit the exhibition, seeing the objects they had talked about acquiring, the difficulties they'd overcome extending loans and just being immersed in all the hard work done by all involved. With Alexa and Rebecca, I also worked on creating risk assessments for equipment and solvents used in exhibition. I also saw the process of updating the conservation standard operating procedures for loans, which were all under review. I also assisted and took part in virtual quizzes and salvage exercises. On returning to the building in August, I worked with Cats on the Page touring exhibition and condition checked a lot of felines. 
Two of my favourite being Edward, Edward Lear's drawing of himself and his cat Foss, shown here, and Gobelino, the witch's cat, shown above, who reminded me a bit of my own cat after she eats too quickly and is inevitably sick on the carpet. Supported by Alexa, I learned how to frame uh, mountain frame items for exhibition and touring loans. I also had the sad job of unmounting framed items which should have travelled to Australia for Endeavour, but never left the building due to COVID-19. In September, I shadowed Amy doing her first virtual couriering, overseeing the loans to the Mayflower Museum in Plymouth. It was an interesting comparison to the deinstall from Buddhism, where I'd shadowed Liz in person. There was a lot of trying to get light in the right places to help identify damage outlined in condition reports, a lot of iPads moving from side to side, which made me feel a little seasick, fitting as it was for a maritime exhibition. However, after a while, I did get used to this method, and I believe it will be a real asset in the future, providing a good opportunity to try and network between, to network between institutions. Moving on to another collaborative project. In 2019, a partnership formed between the British Library and the Palestinian Museum. This collaboration with the BL led them to setting up their first paper conservation studio in the West Bank of the museum, followed by reciprocal training visits at the BL and in Palestine. This year, they were due to have, another, have a further visit in person. However, due to the global COVID-19 restrictions, the current training moved online. It was a good opportunity to come up with some creative solutions on how to deliver these virtually. This project was led by Amy and Jess, who invited me to shadow and assist them when preparing for and completing the online sessions. We filmed training videos, which covered many topics, such as handling, resizing, and solvent safety. Using my graphic skills, I created handouts to accompany the videos and online sessions, such as step-by-step -step illustrations for enclosures. This has provided me with invaluable experience of collaborative investigation, showing me how I can support my colleagues with the skills I can offer. It has given me insight into working within boundaries of a budget, adhering to relevant COSH guidelines, being as economical as possible, particularly when considering the availability of materials, the needs and ethical considerations of another culture, identifying best practice and managing my time to strict deadlines. A January lockdown project with an investigation into curatorial decision-making processes. Through bid work and my practical projects, I've really valued the interaction I've had with curators. Near the beginning of my internship, I attended the cultural property and due diligence training. This explains the legal framework as well as the library policy and best professional practice relating to cultural property when acquiring a new item. As the cultural background, significance and sensitivity is always something I consider when treating an object, it was interesting to hear how this is considered at the point of acquisition. For part of this session, we were shown how, to, how curators fill out paperwork when acquiring an item, known as a due diligence form. This contains all the details of the object and has a section focusing on its provenance. This gave me a wonderful insight into what the curatorial team have to consider and how they look for gaps um, and look to fill gaps in their collection when acquiring material. This combined with having had the opportunity to work on such wonderful, varied and wonderful objects during my time at the British Library has resulted in a real interest in the process by which items are selected for conservation before the preservation bid stage. After a discussion with Amy, we decided to pursue this further as a working from home task. These discussions were a chance to ask the curators how they identify damaged items within their collection areas before they reach the bid stage. With Amy and Zoe, I designed the overall structure of these sessions by devising a list of questions to ask. Held over Zoom in January and February, we had three informal sessions with eight curators from various heritage collections. Designed to be chats over coffee, from these conversations came thoughtful and honest observations about how curators approach conservation and how their expectations and thoughts differ. It was a wonderful way for me to get an insight into decision making in other areas of the library which impact upon collection care. Positive feedback from these sessions also showed that this is an avenue of communication between conservation and curatorial teams and is something that should be repeated in the future. As the January lockdown continued, I proposed to members of my team that we have a few online sessions together where we looked at some items before treatment and proposed estimates for them. I used these online discussions in the absence of physical collections. We devoted a few hours each week to discuss and practice treatment decision-making options and strategies. I asked members of my team to find a few before photos of objects they had worked on, and I put together a small presentation of case studies, case studies showing damage. 
We looked at the photos together via screen sharing and I proposed my own treatment steps and time allocations. The main focus was collaboration and the sharing of ideas between us all, highlighting the importance of mentorship from peers. The conservator had actually conserved the item, then discussed what really happened, think game show reveal, and how long the treatment had taken. I gained so much from everyone's experience and I encourage all frustrated lockdown conservators to collaborate on something similar. A mock interview took place at the end of my placement. With Zoe, Mark and Amy, we discussed how best to present what I had learned. It was the perfect platform for me to reflect on my time with you all, coupled with their guidance. If I had to narrow my internship down to a few words, one of them would definitely be holistic. My experience at the BL has been so varied. I've had a huge overview of what forms conservation can take. The events of last year forced my internship to change, along with my understanding of the role of a conservator. Throughout my placement at the British Library, I have refined my skills, values, and how I see myself as an emerging conservator. This year has been very different for us all, and I could not have predicted how hard it would be at times. I am finishing my internship, having achieved an awful lot, thanks to hard work combined with the support and generosity of all involved. I also have a clearer understanding of the type of conservator I want to be and how I want my practice to evolve. This has been a wonderful opportunity as a recent graduate, providing the perfect stepping stone and cementing a great framework at the beginning of my conservation career. I have seen my conservation knowledge grow and I've loved being a conservator within a working library and archive. As a naturally reflective person throughout this internship, I've refined my method of working and identified my strengths as well as the areas I need to dedicate more time to. I found the filling in of my activity monitor to be incredibly valuable for analysing how I break up my time between the different standards set by ICON and finding a method of recording which works for me. By doing this, I feel well prepared towards achieving accreditation in the future. Writing quarterly reports alongside a review with Zoe and Lorna at the end of each quarter was a very useful way of reflecting on my current practice with their guidance. I have confirmed that my main area of interest is the history of the book as a mechanical object and learning through the understanding of historic bindings and working with the BL collections has allowed me to develop this. Since beginning my internship, I've been compiling short recordings from each day. I originally planned this to show just how varied a conservator's job is at and away from the bench. However, this year didn't quite turn out as expected. And as we went in and out of lockdown, work and home life blurred as one. These snapshots became more of a social document than I had intended. But here's a glimpse into what 15 months at the British Library have looked like for me for working as a book conservator on site and at home. I've practiced sharing this a bit, but as there's quite a lot of you, the, sight, the, um, the sound might be a little bit out. It's been beaten by a cat. <laughs> Managed to get toilet roll. Oh shit. Oh, if you... 
Question one. Hi. I felt a bit sick. Day seventy. Acidic books that I own. Bean. Uh, and comradeship. Turn for now. You've got a Version of information. And one woman's experience of Merry Christmas! A new variant. How are you alive? So resizing and fine is completely missing. Next up we have this one. The humble silverfish. Hi Before we go to questions, I'd like to give some final words of thanks. I would like to express my gratitude to the Claire Hampson Fund for supporting this ICON internship. To those at ICON, in particular to Lorna Calcutt and Patrick Wife for overseeing this process. To all at the British Library, whom I've worked with and learnt from, in the studio and digitally. To my wonderful and incredibly hardworking supervisor Zoe, my brilliant mentor Amy, and the rest of my team, Heather, Francis, Liz, Timmy, Daisy and Patricia, who supported, inspired, entertained, encouraged, and taught me so much throughout this process. Thank you.